not to hit any of the people behind me in the bar. Hello, how are you? Hi, Brian. Thank you. Great to meet you. So are the editing shackles still on? Say again? Are the bleeping shackles still on? Oh, yeah, we're saying fuck a lot. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. That's how this I know I've done my show. What is that? Ten times an episode. <laughs> who was just here? Dizzy class. <laughs> so what's up? So yeah. season four, tell us everything that's going to happen. We can't do that. We want you to watch the show to find out. <laughs> Thirteen episodes. No. One hour TV. Great. Every week. Uh, well, when last we saw our friends, they had no fucking clue who they were. Mm -hmm. So the first order of business... Um, in a world where you just turn magic back on and then a giant bureaucratic institution like the library just swooped in and took control of it. Um, and meanwhile, a monster of untold power is walking around in your best friend's body. That's a bad time to forget who you are and think you're just an English professor who has some papers to grade. So we start the season kind of having fun with their witness protection. Not a minute longer than it has to, <laughs> but at least that long. No, we can't say that exactly. What we, what we like to say is this, like Dean Fogg composed that spell. He's a really good magician. He wouldn't compose a spell that was easy to undo. So I would say that if you're Alice and you're locked up in the library concerned about them, you're also concerned that the spell is going to really stick. They're not going to be able to break into pieces. So that's where we start the season. Do you think that, though, it's going to be hard with Elliot, especially having like such a big part of the show with Elliot and Margo and their great personalities. Like with those episodes, what's it going to be like when Kale is a monster and Margo doesn't know she is? This is very cool. <laughs> funny? It is funny. It's also like, I mean, without spoiling too much, uh, Janet, the uh, human formerly known as Marco, um, and the monster in the body of Elliot do end up in the same room pretty quickly. And um, there's a layer to it as a viewer where you're watching it, and there's it's like I want them to be Marco and Elliot so badly, mm -hmm. and they're not. So that's a uh, it's like the good kind of torture, in my opinion, for the viewer <laughs> because we know what we want and we're not getting it yet, so we hope right. we'll get it eventually. Um, so, you mentioned Penny a little bit. Have um, you seen the last of our Penny? Is that it for him? Was that his goodbye last season? No. He's pretty fucking dead, though. Yeah, but that's the last one. Nope. Not the last one. So the library has kind of always been there in the story. Sort of, we did, we never really knew their role and everything up until now where they kind of stepped into the forefront. Was there a kind of, um, was it from the onset that you kind of knew the direction the library was going or what their ultimate goal was? Or did it kind of naturally form as you write the season down? I feel like... <laughs> I don't remember exactly when this happened. I, I think um, an interesting thing about writing this show is that America has changed a lot in the time that we've written the show. Like when we first wrote Ember, Trump wasn't even a candidate. And then, and then we were headed towards this reveal that we had this uh, all-powerful god in Hillary who was literally doing everything like it was a reality show and he would just pick the most entertaining thing. And if it wasn't entertaining enough, he would start killing people. Um, and we, I, I think we're just people in the world. We can't really ignore what's going on all around us. And so in writing the story, this institution that, of the library that has kind of been behind the scenes, but they know more than anyone else. They can track anyone. They could surveil you if they wanted to. It's like there but for the grace of their morals and ethics go all of us. And then, and then hand them the responsibility for all the magic in the universe. It's like for some dumb reason we all just wanted to talk about fascism. Like, it's just kind of in the air. What is authoritarianism? So, I mean, our show is always going to be entertaining, and there might be a musical number or a magical creature or both. Uh, but we also are using it, I think, as a vehicle to talk about this stuff at the same time. The show, since it's aired, and before anyone ever saw an episode, the show was always dealing with issues like depression and uh, dependency. 
and uh, discrimination, all those heavy social issues, and it's always done it well. I think a lot of fans identify with that show and look to it now as almost like therapy and the cast and then the way... Uh, do you guys now, when you're breaking stories, do you feel like an extra weight of responsibility to handle those? Now that you know fans are so in tune with and looking at the show for that, does that has that influenced you at I all? Or? I, mean, I don't. No. No, no, I don't. I don't say that lightly. But I always remind myself of something wonderful that Jeremy, Jeremy Irons said something amazing when he was um, cast as Humbert Humbert in the remake of Lolita, which is kind of a hot button part. Sure. You know? um, I believe his exact quote was to portray something is not to condone it. Yeah. Right. I get to remember you're portraying something. Right. You want to be honest, you want to do your research, you want to try and either access parts of yourself that have been through that or talk to you have been through that. If you're dealing with something like rape, you have to have a rape hotline at the end, which we did, because you don't know what's going to trigger someone. Sure. But at the end of the day, you're writing Macbeth or Saving Private Ryan or Star Wars. You know? Right. You're, you're writing something to entertain and hopefully engage. And the minute you cross into, I'm going to tell you how to have a better life, go start a religion. You know, because you're not doing you're not doing drama. Right. I guess the follow up would that be: Has sci-fi ever come in? If you can say, has sci-fi ever come in? And be like, no, 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 too far, not, too far. Not once. Mm-hmm. No. Never. They were interested yeah. in the sexual assault scene. Yeah. Like that was the scene that we talked sure. to um, the executives at Sci-Fi about. They were. Um, hands-on just in that they wanted to know more about how it was going to be shot and how it was going to be edited and um, to their credit they watched an early cut and they pointed out the one shot that had Mm -hmm. remained in that wasn't very strongly in the point of view of Julia Mm -hmm. and I mean we were really glad that they had pointed it out it made the scene a lot cleaner and it made the point of view stronger Um, but they were our partners in that they wanted us to do it they just wanted to uh, you know help us do it properly Networks like sci-fi and and particularly shows like The Magicians have become much more of a forefront for feminism. Um, Female leads who aren't shrinking violence and they have, you know, they're not put in their place, they're fierce and flawed at the same time. What about this balance is important for females to see represented? And how has that, like, impacted the way that the show has been? I feel like I I just (laughs) (laughs) just did the same job about so much. I really feel like I should answer. John. That. <laughs> he gets annoyed when I point out how big a feminist he is. I am not a feminist. <laughs> I am a happily veered. You're sometimes a, a bad feminist, but no, you're a feminist. No, no one who's read as much Ian Fleming as I have is a feminist. <laughs> you should take this. I mean, it's a, well, my answer to that is sort of similar to the question about how you deal with mental health stuff. Like, the thing that's most important to me is just to portray these characters honestly. So I think. We were uh, uh, halfway there when we were given these characters from Lab's books, and then we invented a few more, like Katie and Ben, along the way. It's just, it seems to me like it should be a no-brainer, and the reason we're having this conversation is because it's not always. But certainly for all the writers that we work with, and for ourselves, once you have a character, it's your job to portray him or her honestly and three-dimensionally, and not to ever just use them to tell the other character's story. You know, um, certainly we have storylines that are more in one character's POV or another character's POV. But ultimately, the trick isn't even really about a balance between strong and weak or flawed and fierce or anything like that. It's just who is Alice? What is her story? What is true about Alice? Um, and we have a really nice mix of men and women writing the show, and it's a mix of our experiences and our observations. And I think we kind of go from there. Yeah, actually, I think every new director to come join the show in the last two seasons has been a woman. Am I right about that? Yeah. Um, our producing director, Chris Fisher, is very active in finding up and coming uh, diverse directors, female directors, and mentoring them, giving them opportunities to shadow. Yeah, th- because the, in um, my opinion, just watching things, I feel like the industry is changing and has made it a bit more of a priority to open up directing in particular because it was a very, very closed job. It was probably the most um, honest about its sexism. Um, and there were really, I, for, I would go years and never work with a female director as I was kind of coming up through the writer's room. And now that uh, uh, 
the powers that be have been made aware of this problem in a way that has kind of forced their hand a little bit, right? Now that there's this mandate, I think it's now up to the creators of shows. It's up to producing directors and showrunners and people involved in it to foster a new generation of talent so that the pool gets bigger and bigger. So that's where we are now. Yeah. So what magic, what magic spell would you like to be able to cast? I would like for the script to write itself. <laughs> Just script elves in the middle of the night, like shoe elves, but for scripts. How's the technical aspect? Because I know early on you did a lot of practical effects, and last year clearly not all practical. Um, how, how's the next season shaping up? Well, I think the first season was a lot of, hopefully not obvious, a lot, a lot of trial and error. So it wasn't so much that it was more practical and less, say, CGI. It was just more. This didn't work. Let's try this. Let's reshoot this. You know, by season two we kind of had a balance. I think by season three we sort of had a team in place that would always know the best way to attack a certain scene. So. All right. That's all the time we have, guys. Thank you guys very much.